He uh, then had a brief time as a postdoctoral assistant at the University of Oxford from 1973 to 1975. He then moved in 1976 to Arizona State University where he is now and he has been very highly honored in the United Kingdom as having been elected as a foreign member of the Royal Society. That was in 2015. John is a, a well-known leader in electron microscopy on defects and semiconductors, but now he is very much engaged in a totally new and very, very important area for the future of crystallography. John is Professor of Physics at Arizona State University, and he's a Director of Science at the National Science Foundation BioXFL Science and Technology Center. His field of research at the moment is on the crystallography of X-ray lasers, and John is going to tell you about the latest developments in that field. Please welcome Professor John Spence. Thanks very much, Mike. And thanks to the organizers for the invitation and the great honor to give this talk. It was Richard Feynman who said that all living things can be understood in terms of the wiggling and jiggling of atoms. And I guess this has captured the imagination of biologists ever since the first protein, myoglobin, was solved by Kendrew in the 1950s. But I remember as a student in 1970, reading a paper by Breed, Love and Trammell in Physical Review Letters where they said that single molecules will never be imaged because the radiation dose necessary to do it would destroy them. But I've seen two revolutions in the last 15 years which changed this picture completely. The first is lensless imaging, that is successful solutions to the non-crystallographic phase problem that we can use for diffraction from individual single particles. And the second is the discovery that it's possible to outrun most radiation damage. So I'll talk about what we can use these breakthroughs for, for to make movies of molecular machines at work, movies in some sense. And I'll use some highlights for that um, from the BioXFL consortium of seven universities in the United States. Uh, we, we were funded by the NSF to devise, develop and apply the X-ray laser to structural biology. The XFL works by jiggling electrons sideways as they pass through a linear accelerator, producing X-rays in the forward direction. But you get gain and lasing of a kind when the electric field from the X-rays acts back on the electrons to concentrate their bunching. And that gain can be as much as 10 to the fifth. There are no lasers for electrons. This idea came up first by Mady in 1972. He died, unfortunately, quite recently. Uh, and there are now many lasers around the world being built, as I'll show. At the first beam time in 2009 at the world's first X-ray laser, December 2009, it was immediately obvious that we were seeing something completely new. This is an example where we saw interference fringes directly between the Bragg spots because the coherence length of the beam was bigger than the entire crystal. These were about one micron crystals. For normal protein crystallography, you need only a coherence width bigger than the molecule. Ours was bigger than the crystal. And so we saw this shape transform effect. And by counting those fringes, we could tell exactly how many planes of atoms we had or molecules in the crystal, just as you can with a slit with end slits in it, a grating with end slits in it if you shine lasers on it. But it was really Henry Chapman and his incredible drive, his enthusiasm and energy and deep understanding of the diffraction physics, which got this first consortium, uh, uh, this large collaboration of scientists, uh, to be successful in that early work and demonstrate that this could be useful for bi structural biology. So I'll talk about making molecular movies. Um, <clears throat> and the main point, I suppose this is the main point of the talk, as we've heard in some of the micro symposia, is that because you can outrun damage 
you don't need to cool the sample uh, to avoid damage, and therefore you can study proteins at room temperature under physiological conditions in the correct thermal bath. That's the main point, because molecular machines need both the stochastic thermal fluctuations, they need to be battered by surrounding waters, together with the energy available from ATP to do their job. And so we have the chance to do that now, to separate the effects of the, the intrusive effects of the beam uh, from the chemistry. We want, to, we want to reduce mechanisms to chemistry, as Prick once said. And we can do that now because we can separate the two effects. So there are different time domains and uh, techniques and length scales involved from the fast electronic processes to the much slower processes involving diffusion and particularly entropy as a term in the Gibbs free energy. Uh, it, to, taking, to, to find the, that macrostate with the largest number of microstates uh, takes a while, and molecules take a while to find each other in solution. So our time scale is enormous, from a femtoseconds to seconds, as you'll see. Why would you use an XFEL for structural biology? There are many reasons given here. I've mentioned outrunning radiation damage, collecting the X-rays before the cascade of photoelectrons vaporizes the crystal. They either, for very small crystals, escape the crystal entirely, in which case the crystal explodes by a Coulomb explosion. You leave it strong with a strong positive charge. Or if a large, with a larger crystal, the, where the range of the secondary electrons is smaller than the crystal, they'll thermalize and take the temperature very high above the sun, in fact, temperature of the sun. So the problem then is a bit similar to the design of the atom bomb. There are, there are similar rate equations, and you have a critical mass, just as you do for the atom bomb. Um, why would you use an XFEL? We, we, we have better time resolution, sometimes important in, with electronic processes like photosynthesis. We can study non-cyclic reactions. Uh, we can study very small crystals. It's, all, it's not that you cannot grow larger crystals, it's just it takes so long. Petra Fromm once told me it took her about six years to figure out how to grow crystals large enough in Berlin back in 1998 for crystallography for synchronous even after she had showers of microcrystals. So it's the, the time. Uh, and two other very important points. These crystals are so small that they're saturated by light from the pump laser. So we, it's something very difficult to do with large crystals. And diffusion times are small because the crystals are small. And so uh, we can do diffusive mixing, and as you've heard in the micro symposia. That's really important, turning out to be one of the main important features. Why is time-resolved imaging itself important? Well, this has been uh, criticized in the literature. I know there's controversy about this, um, but I'll just mention two reasons. There is the idea that stable intermediate phases could be used as drug targets. Secondly, as Keith Moffat has pointed out, if we can test our models at much higher time and space resolution, th then they provide more severe constraints on the molecular dynamics. We can test the potentials in molecular dynamics if we can get better time resolution and spatial resolution. So I'd like to start with this issue of reduced damage, because it's very difficult to, show, to compare work at a synchrotron and an XFEL. There have been papers uh, famously trying to do that. I think the most convincing work is this work uh, from the Californian group recently published in PNAS. What they did was the following. They looked at the reduction of a heavy atom, meaning that it has too many electrons, produced by the X-ray beam, unwanted electrons. Um, they compared the reduction of heavy atoms in a protein at a synchrotron and the same sample at the XFEL. And their finding was that XFELs cause less reduction of heavy atoms than synchrotrons. I'm putting it very crudely to get your attention. How did they do it? It's very careful, quantitative, uh, thorough work. They use bond length, as people have often done, as a proxy for charge state of the iron, the oxidation state of the iron Fe atom, which goes from 4 plus to 3 plus. And they make a plot of dose against bond length. It's shown here. Do I have a pointer? I do. Ah. Right. Okay. Can you make it work? Oh, okay. Thanks. How? 
right, that's terrific. So here's our plot of uh, bond length against um, dose, and it's a beautiful straight line from many experiments on a synchrotron. They then take that sample across the same material to the, the LCLS and repeat the experiment and find that taking these very brief snapshots, they get a bond length which agrees only with the very lowest dose at the synchrotron. That is the dose that corresponds to the natural correct, correct chemical state of the iron atom. So let's talk first about fast reactions with light sensitive proteins where you can use a pump laser as a trigger. And we heard a lot of that in the last couple of days from wonderful talks by our speakers in the micro symposia. Uh, we use the method of serocrystallography and that has origins long ago. Uh, Bruce Doak and I started thinking after urging from Henry Chapman uh, to develop a sample delivery system for the LCLS in the early 2000s but it didn't really start to work till we got these sort of patents from MS2 viruses at the ALS uh, around 2008. But you can pump those samples, so this is what that looks like. Uh, as you've seen, this is the gas dynamic virtual nozzle where we have a high pressure stream of gas which is focusing down this stream of liquid. We do that to avoid clogging. It took us a few years to figure out that that was the way to beat the clogging problem. And down here is an image of the way it breaks up into droplets according to the theory which Rayleigh published in 1890, which is relevant to sort of a tap dripping, a faucet dripping. Uh, and you can see over here I've shown the uh, pump laser here coming in, exciting the molecules shortly before they get their snapshot taken further downstream here with a Bragg beam going off to the side. So I'll show what... Uh, I'll show uh, some of the work from Mati uh, Marius Schmidt's group, which you saw from Pandi this afternoon. Th this is photoactive yellow protein at 1.4 angstrom resolution. A pump probe studies. It's a light sensitive protein. Uh, it, it's not the same as photosynthesis. It uses light detection to affect its, its uh, survival. And we've taken the Bragg spots at different time delays, so each time delay between when you excite the molecule and when you take its snapshot is a different frame in the movie, and for each delay you need to collect lots of diffraction patterns in every orientation to make a three-dimensional charge density map. So the little microcrystals, there are typically a couple of microns, are tumbling across, sprayed across, hydrated across as they run across the pulsed X-ray beam, and we read out about 120 frames, diffraction patterns per second at the LCLS. It'll be more like 10,000 at Hamburg when uh, the European XFIL starts shortly. So the image is being rocked just to show that it's three-dimensional. And the colors here correspond to the colors in the reaction pathway shown on the left. And you'll see that there are two of those. Uh, so we've got yellow here at the moment, which means we're around here at the yellow uh, image over here on the reaction chart. And you have to remember that this is a snapshot of a statistical ensemble at one instant in time. So we start all the, different, all the molecules in the crystal at the same instant. They may get out of step. There are, broadly speaking, three kinds of molecules in the crystal, those that were not affected at all by the pump laser, those that are going around reaction cycle one, and those going around number two. And we measure a kind of spatial periodic average in the Bragg beam intensities. But you can unscramble that by modeling and singular value decomposition, as um, was explained this afternoon by Pandey, and, and put this all together in a kind of movie where the color coding corresponds to the species. So what we're really looking at here is just the amount of these intermediate species as they come and go during the reaction cycle. And one can extract the amounts from the charge density maps and then plot them out as a function of time and fit them to rate equations. Those rate equations typically show exponential behavior and they're shown here. This is the amount of species PRT, which was one of the colored molecules in the previous movie, as a function of time. And you see the amounts change as the reaction proceeds. We did, that was the first beam time, the more recent one it went to much higher time resolution. Uh, Marius was able to get times down to about 150 femtoseconds, 
So this is very by f the fastest that's been done. And the important process there is a cis-trans isomeration reaction. Bottom is orthogonal projection. Time fr the time between pump and probe is given at the bottom, time sequence along here. And the cis-trans reaction occurs about, a rotation about this axis, which I've identified here with a dotted line. So this, to the left of this arrow, it's all trans, and on the other side, it's uh, cis. And this is an example, as we heard, of a conical intersection where there's a degeneracy in the nuclear coordinates, you have the same nuclear coordinates for the excited and ground state. So again, from that you can work out uh, the amounts of species that come and go and, and understand in detail the, chem the chemical dynamics. But we knew that it much more important, that not all proteins are light sensitive, and it was most important to try to extend these methods to mixtures, experiments where two solutions mix in in solution, for example, a substrate and an enzyme. Uh, that seemed to me the important problem back in 2010 when I gave this project to my student, Dingy Wang, and he did a fine job of making a mixing uh, device so that we could try to image chemical dynamics by similar methods where we were mixing two solutions. And I'll give two quick examples of that, the RNA riboswitch and beta-lactamase. So this is the mixer that <coughs> Dingy and I came up with uh, in around 2014. There have been much better designs published since w that we've heard about in the last couple of days. We tried to make it like a telescope where you could slide these capillary tubes inside e each other. The idea was to bring in the substrate along B and perhaps an enzyme along A, and we wanted that in crystalline form. There's plenty of work at synchrotrons with solution cells, mixing cells, and we worked with Lois Pollock at Cornell, who's an expert in that area. We, we, once we saw that we could get results with micron crystals, we realized that if we could do diffusing misting in crystals, we'd have a way to get uh, atomic resolution by taking advantage of that Bragg boost, which gives you so much more scattering at high angles. So we wanted little crystallites coming along in A. Then you have to get the substrate into the crystal. Well, that takes a while. Um, the molecules, of course, half the unit cell might be water. So if you imagine that thing, there are these sort of natural gates and alleyways, as Shakespeare put it, before, between all the little molecules uh, where the substrate has to diffuse in. And Marius did a wonderful job in calculating these diffusion times. I'll show you in a second. For crystals, they're quite different from solutions. And they mix for a while here before the reaction can start. The small molecule has to glom onto the molecules in the crystal before the reaction can start, and then you have a reaction time here. So the resolution, the time resolution of the me method is fixed by this mixing time for the diffusion into the crystal. And then they emerge into vacuum and get their snapshot taken here by a sort of 40 femtosecond per second pulse, and we, those pulses are coming along 120 times a second. We still use an outer focusing gas to squeeze down the size of the jet uh, and, and allow us to use a much larger nozzle here, which, because it's large, won't clog. Here are those calculations, and you'll see for a 1 by 2 micron crystal, I think this is lysozyme and glucose, uh, the diffusion time is about 30 microseconds for the substrate to get throughout the crystal, work its way throughout the crystal. So that's, that's fast, because often these reaction intermediates come and go on a scale of milliseconds. And that was important, and, and uh, that was published independently. Now, up until recently, we've been making the nozzles, making a mixing nozzle obviously very difficult. We had very skilled people and a couple of postdocs on that, um, Dan DuPont in particular, who now the LCLS. But recently, I got a grant from the NIH to buy a most wonderful piece of apparatus. Uh, it's a 3D printer. You, I'm sure you know that the Nobel Prize went for super resolution optical imaging a couple of years ago. Um, well, of course, if you can image with super resolution, two photon methods, for example, you can print with super resolution. And that's what this nanoscribe machine does with about 200 nanometer spatial resolution. And it's 3D, and the wonderful thing about it is it, it will make anything you like that you can give it a CAD drawing for, uh, and it liberates you from the two-dimensional uh, the um, planar lithography limitation, the prison, as it were, of the semiconductor industry in lithography. You can make arbitrary three-dimensional shapes. 
So for trying out ideas and prototyping, it's absolutely a wonderful thing. And we make our mixing jets and other structures that way. So this just shows a, a GDNV, gas dynamic virtual nozzle, with the gas and the fluid flows here that we made with this gadget. You can give it a CAD drawing of the San Francisco Golden Gate Bridge and it'll go whoa, whoa, click, click for a few hours and spit out a tiny perfect model of it that you can barely see. Now, Alex Ross at ASU in the chemistry department has another scheme. We heard some fabulous schemes today, uh, the conveyor belt system, the droplet system, uh, the roadrunner scheme at, at CS, at, in Hamburg. These are excellent ways to do business. Uh, Alex's idea is to, as it were, mix oil and vinegar. And when you do that, you get little droplets because they're immiscible. And she can vary the rate at which they're spat out into the vacuum to the x-ray beam. Uh, and we want to try and synchronize those with the beam. You might think one of the first things, of course, we thought to do back in 06 was to get a pulse from the photocathode of the LCLS and use it to trigger on-demand droplets. But uh, we found, we, we tried that, and we found it only worked for very big droplets, bigger than about 30 microns. So we thought we wouldn't get anything funded that way because they'd tell us you could do the work at a synchrotron. Um, but it, for the reasons we heard this afternoon, that was bad thinking and um, the, the value of outrunning damage is uh, more important. So I think this is quite a good way to go and we'll try this out in a few weeks. My second example of mixing, or I'm sorry, first example of mixing then is gene expression regulation. And this is a collaboration uh, with Yun Wang at the National Cancer Institute. This is a wonderful mechanism where nature uh, achieves modulation of protein production in response to an environmental change. So this is not molecular evolution at all over generations of DNA. It was proposed long ago by Mono in 1961 and confirmed experimentally around, only recently around 2002. So the messenger RNA, uh, one domain of that is called a riboswitch, switch, uh, picks up a molecule, in this case uh, it's adenine, and that ligand binding then uh, can switch off the mRNA function in uh, stimulating protein production over at the ribosome shown here. So it's something that happens between transcription and translation. Uh, and your, Wang wanted to see this. The question was, could we make a movie of this, pro of this process? It would be very important because it's an environmental response. This is what all organisms are going to do with global warming or something like that. Or, so, and it's different from epigenetics and, and so forth. The, the, well, that's a long story. So here's the result after a long mixing time. And you see the, um, <coughs> the open and closed forms here. We've imaged them from their charge density maps with a mixing apparatus. And over on the right here, after a long uh, time, after 10 seconds, you see the adenine shown in red here. Uh, the full mixing time is about a minute, and we have in another paper the fully reacted state, which is different. So this is a partial reaction after 10 seconds in gene expression regulation. The second example is again Marius Schmidt's group, uh, and he was interested in beta-lactamase's effect as a, uh, in, in antibiotic resistance. So the beta-lactams are a class of antibiotics. They're derived from penicillin originally. And of course, with time, uh, resistance has evolved in the form of an enzyme, beta-lactamase. And we'd like to see that happening, make a movie of that, to see the, un understand the mechanism. So again, we only have one frame at this in this published paper. More recently, we've got more data. But you see here, the beta-lactam uh, beta antibiotic is in this position and this position over here, and the remainder of this loop uh, is the lactamase, the enzyme. But in a subsequent beam time, we're able to get more data and get a total of four frames for a movie at different times. So this is, uh, I think, 30 milliseconds, 100 milliseconds, um, 300, 500 milliseconds and two seconds. The times are given here. So this is time going down this way. This was one type of crystal, and over here is a different type of crystal for the same molecule. Uh, these are two of the sites in the molecule and two subunits. It's clearer if you look at the uh, sketches over here of the crystal structure, of the molecular structure, because 
what, ha what the enzyme does to prevent this thing from acting as an antibiotic uh, is to open the ring I've shown here with arrow uh, by a nucleophilic attack on a SER70 oxygen atom. So it's hydrolysis which opens that ring and then inhibits the antibiotic effect. So this is important because it's a one pathway reaction. It's irreversible. And that's because we destroy every crystal each time we look at it. This is great for irreversible reactions, which of course are the majority of the catalytic processes in, in the human body. Uh, you just, you know, you do the thing once and get a snapshot and then you bring in a new sample and do it again. Quite different from the mode of operating with large crystals at a synchrotron. So what we want to do now is expand the range of triggers, and that's the plan. The BioXFEL has been going for four years. We'll come to the beginning of the second five years next summer, um, <coughs> unless our funding is trumped in some way. And then in the second five years, uh, we, we hope to expand the range of triggers for these sorts of experiments. I've given a list there. The aim is to extract the kinetics, uh, kinetic mechanisms, rate coefficients, barriers of uh, activation, and the structures of intermediates. Um, you can imagine other triggers such as heat jumps have been tried in the past, caged molecules. Uh, Matthias Frank is interested in applying electric fields to iron pumps uh, synchronously with the photocathode. And of course there's terahertz pumping, a probe which people are looking into, and ligand binding. Uh, and in my lab we're thinking about getting two shots from the same crystal and sandwiching the pump in between them. And then, of course, the statistics are hugely improved. The errors drop uh, enormously because you're comparing bright and dark from the same crystal before and after it's been pumped by light. Uwe Weierstahl had a good idea. I'd been to a conference in Ireland around uh, 2010 where I met Martin Caffrey for the first time, a great champion of lipid cubic phase, this viscous medium and uh, when I told Uwe about it back at ASU, he immediately said, oh, that's the way to stop the problem of waste in these sample delivery devices. Because all the protein, as we heard yesterday, this, this afternoon, between shots goes to waste. So if you can make the thing come out more slowly, you don't waste so much. And, and LCP is wonderful because then you're delivering the membrane protein, for example, in the same medium in which you're growing it. So it all becomes a very efficient process. It's like a toothpaste jet. And the stuff comes out, the, the, the proteins are crystals, crystal lights are coming out at about the same rate that the X-ray pulses are coming along. And the whole thing is far more efficient. And in the hands of, um, I should say, Vlad, Vadim Cherezov, who is a good close collaborator with us, uh, uh, quite a number of GPCR structures have been solved in this way, which couldn't have been solved other way, by growing them in LCP and injecting them directly. These are about 60% of drug targets now, and here are some of the ones that have appeared in high visibility journals uh, over the last five or six years. Adenosine, the smoothen receptor that makes uh, lambs born with a single eye, Cyclops. The glucogen receptor, uh, the anti anti well, uh, angiotensin for high blood pressure, of course, um, and uh, serotonin and the delta opioid receptor, very important for this uh, uh, opium addiction, painkiller addiction problem that we have around the world at the moment. So here it is working, or it should be. Ah, why not? This is the toothpaste jet running. So this is the LCP being extruded. It's got this gas jacket around it, and you can see the, the beam, the LCLS X-ray beam, is just drilling holes across through this tube of goo, right? So this is viscous stuff. It's like um, car grease. Yeah, it's coming out here, and the X-ray beam, w the LCLS beam, drills a hole in stainless steel immediately. Okay, so it certainly is going to drill a hole in this LCP lipid cubic phase. And you see these gaps. What we're seeing here is a sort of map of the time structure of the beam imprinted on our LCP tube, uh, but there are gaps in it. And the gaps, we found out later, were occasions when the people in the control room were sending the beam off to another experiment. We, I'm not sure we actually knew about that at the time. So you get a picture of the time structure of the beam as it's running. Now, since that work was done, uh, other groups have come up with alternative media. The Japanese, in particular, have an excellent medium for soluble proteins, 
Uh, I think mineral oils are one idea. Uh, agarose has been shown to work, and more recently, a particular form of peg. So, so that looks a very way, a good way to go. And it's, I should say it's now being used for time resolved work. You might think there's too much background. Well, there isn't. And uh, there's a paper in Nature on how to do time resolved pump probe studies, I think bacteria rhodopsin, uh, using this viscous jet. So serial crystallography has taken on now an independent life of its own <coughs> uh, at synchrotrons, and we've been supporting people to do that. Here's just a list of some of the labs that are doing it uh, at Petro 2 in Germany, at the SRF, at CHESS, at XFEL, uh, of course, uh, I'm sorry, at uh, ESRF, at the APS, uh, the SL, at, and most recently we've started programs in Brookhaven at their new synchrotron and at the Advanced Light Source in Berkeley. So it works there because, not because you have a fast source, but because you have a fast enough detector. And the whole idea is, for example, with LCP, uh, if you have millisecond shutter time on these wonderful new detectors we have now, then the crystallites are not going to rotate significantly. The diffraction conditions won't change during the exposure. So we're doing what Rossman, Michael Rossman once described as the American method, shoot first, ask questions later and uh, don't forget about goniometers. So you work out the orientation of the crystal with clever software later on and just collect data continuously with one of these jets. And, and as the diffraction upgrades are being implemented around the world, uh, so I think serial crystallography is becoming more and more popular. It's just a more efficient way to do business. Now, this is a plug for Henry's talk on Monday morning. Um, Henry's group has made a really important breakthrough in discovering this diffuse scattering between Bragg reflections in membrane proteins where they have a particular kind of disorder that is static disorder. The molecules are shifted, displaced, with a pure displacement from the lattice site. You get a form of diffuse scattering which is nothing more than the molecular transform, except around the origin. And that can be used for two things. As you can see here, the Bragg's fading out about here, but the diffuse goes far further out you get much higher resolution, and because it's continuous and, and give us a Shannon sampling, you can help phase the data. It helps solve the phase problem. So that's a really important discovery, I think, because it allows you to use bad crystals, and most of our crystals are bad. And not only that, but it gives you better resolution because they're bad. So do go along on Monday at 9 a.m. and don't miss this talk, which Henry will be giving. He's, they're applying it to other systems now. I wanted to mention solution scattering with X-ray lasers. Uh, the first uh, and maybe the most important work was done by Richard Neutz's group, and they, they're interested in reaction center. And this just shows the difference in scattering as a function, scattering angle, for different times. Uh, and in their paper, because they know this, the uh, unexcited structure very precisely from previous crystallography, with a bit of modeling, they can get a movie out of this. And of course, you don't need crystals, it's wonderful. Uh, reaction center is rather special in that way, but they were able to answer these questions as to why solar photons, two and a half EV, don't unfold proteins, which you know is much greater energy than you need to unfold them, and also to dis uh, to break down that motion into a kind of quake motion and a heat motion uh, corresponding to different scattering angles. So. Solution scattering at XFELS is going ahead and I think is going to be very important in the future. Notice the terrific resolution out to, well, I, probably more realistically, three or four or three angstroms. <clears throat> um, I'll say something now about some work which comes out in Nature Methods today, actually, from the Abbas Almast group. It follows an earlier paper between, with Joachim Frank and Abbas on cryo-M data where they were able to construct an energy landscape from their data. Now, the basic idea here is that if you quench from an equilibrium ensemble, the fraction of, uh, of structures you get in each class is related to their energy differences, and they are related by a Boltzmann factor. So if we look here at this expression, I can't, here, here. If we have two, the fraction N1 of conformation one, N2 of, N2 of, of conformation 2, differing energy by delta E12, then this will give us the ratio of the amounts of those two conformations. 
So if I know the total amount of data I've got, which of course you know, and I say that I only want one example, the rarest example of the largest energy change, the largest conformation change you would see in your ensemble, then I can put N1 equal to 1. So I know big N, I know this is 1, I can solve for N2, and you can then show that you can work out the energy change you can get from a given amount of data. Now, this is uh, familiar from cryo-M analysis. So perhaps you get a million uh, images with, in cryo-M. At the LCLS, you get about 10 million per day. In Hamburg, at the European XFIL, they can expect uh, 3,000 million per day. If I convert those to energies, this is 8 kT and this is 18 kT, which is more than the energy per ATP. So these are, we're looking at equilibrium, you get a range of structures in equilibrium necessarily because they're in equilibrium. We're trapping them, quenching them as you would in the Vitrobot, but here it's in this jet we're firing, and we're getting the X-ray diffraction pattern, not the real space image as you would in cryo-M, so we have a phase problem and so forth, Friedel's law. But you can work backwards in that way. And this is a kind of energy landscape. Now, it has to be said that finding a configuration coordinate itself is not so easy. You may not be able to do that. What does that mean? The simplest case would be a hinge motion, and then the configuration coordinate would be the angle of opening of the hinge. And then a single number, a single parameter, describes the structural change, the dynamics. Well, that's what you want. You want to parameterize the motion in as few parameters possible. Uh, and these energy changes can be obtained from the fraction of conformations in each uh, class. Now, for single particle work, this is one virus per shot, not crystals. We get patterns like this. This is work a few years ago with Ilma Schlichting's group, and it's chlorella. It's an icosahedral virus shown here, so of course you get something like a Bessel function. That's the diffraction pattern. It's got lots of rings, uh, 16 rings, I think, and so the, the resolution's about 130 angstroms. So this is a few years ago. We can do slightly better now. And Abbas group uh, have got such data from, this is the PR772 virus. Uh, it was collected, the data was collected by a consortium, an international collaboration. Janus Hoidu was prominent among those people, Henry, uh, and, and so on. And we collected data over a period of a couple of years. And you're going to see papers come out over the next few months which uh, take that data. That the data is public now. For anyone can grab this data. It looks like uh, that. That's an example of what the... If you get X-ray fraction from one virus, and I have to say that had never been done before, the LCLS started in 2009. This is the kind of data you get, just a Fourier transform of the virus. Um, roughly speaking. So Amos has uh, been the first to publish a reconstruction of this community data, which is public, and his reconstructions are shown down below. Now, this is quite remarkable because, uh, again, uh, sorting these by class, you have an ensemble of images, you sort them by similarity using cross-correlation methods. Okay, put the ones most similar to each other beside each other in a string, and we can call that a movie. And sure enough, what they find is uh, if they don't impose icosahedral symmetry, they see what they believe is the beginning of the expression of the genome, shown here. Yeah? Now, it's very important to show that that is not due to salts or impurities plating out in the droplets on the particle. And their evidence that it's not is that the density in the center decreases. And they have found a, co uh, a configuration coordinate which explains this motion. Now, the resolution here is about 80 angstrom. That's what um, uh, we, was talked about. Russell was talking about a single digit resolution. It's, it's uh, I think, 8 nanometers, which has been an important milestone for our project for the last years. So, this was assembled from 30,000 shots. As I say, the resolution is, is much worse, 9 nanometers. You can remember these numbers easily. You know, in uh, cryo-M tomography, if we're very, very generous, we could say they have a resolution of about a, 1 nanometer. Here's 10 nanometers. And the super-resolution optical in the hands of someone like Eric Bedzig is 100 nanometers, which is a tenth of a micron. So it goes 1, 100, 1, 10, 100. Uh, 
And of course, the super resolution optical is the only one where you can get images of living things uh, at high speed, but they have a radiation damage problem too. So these are all different complementary approaches. Uh, and this would, I think, you, they claim, it's a reasonable claim, it's the first conformational movie of a virus by any technique, and the first determination of reaction coordinate for the extrusion of the viral genome. They have an energy landscape, similar to the one I showed, uh, and it has the potential to access the transition states that, that are rate limiting in this process of genome extrusion by single particle FEL. So I think that's a, a really an amazing result. I haven't said anything about data analysis, but again, I want to give a plug to Tom White, who's here. He's the author of the main data analysis package, the most popular one that's used worldwide for uh, serial crystallography. It's called Christfel, and he's giving a class on that on Saturday at 3.15, so please go along. The short story here is that uh, lots of people around the world have made contributions since we started back around 2010. Rick Kirian, Tom White were the originators of this. Uh, and the error in your structure factor measurements, this is our split, falls off as the square root, one on the square root of the number of shots. It's a uh, Poisson process which has the unfortunate property that you need 100 times more data to add one significant figure. 100 times more data to add one significant figure. So it falls off as one on root n, and this is experimental data fitted to number of diffraction patterns. And there's a constant k, and we can summarize the research over the last uh, seven years by just saying that the value of k has dropped dramatically in the hands of people like Helen Jin and, and Nick Souter and uh, other groups around the world that have contributed, and Tom particularly, uh, to improving the iterative refinement process with modeling that goes into dealing with this data. It's a long story and we don't have time for it, unfortunately. Um, so let me move towards the end now by just mentioning a couple of new ideas. The first is that we're building an X-ray laser on my campus at Arizona State University near Phoenix. <clears throat> and this is the plan of the machine. I understand we're, this is not a conference of accelerator physicists, but what is remarkable about this machine is it's so small and it's so cheap. So we use a very short LINAC here, electron accelerator fits on a bench top. Uh, and we, the basic idea is to use a laser as the undulator. I'll explain why that's a good idea in a moment. Uh, so the cost has come down from the 600 million for the LCLS to about 6 million for one of these machines, which fits in a very large room. So, let me just say that this, method, this machine is based on the inverse Compton effect. Uh, and that's rather different from the SACI mode of the LCLS and the other X-ray lasers. And I can explain why we save so much money here uh, as follows. With Wiggler radiation, the X-ray wavelength is equal to uh, the Wiggle period divided by the electron beam energy. It's easy to remember. So at the LCLS, they have magnets a few centimeters apart, which wiggle the electrons sideways as they go down the beam. Uh, that makes an oscillating a dipole radiator. If you accelerate, charged particles ex radiate, as we teach our students, and you get x-rays in the forward direction. The wavelength of the x-rays, again, is that wiggle period divided by gamma squared, which is the electron beam energy. Now, if you could divide top and bottom of that expression by 100 or 1,000, you'd have the same X-ray energy. Uh, and we do that by using an optical laser to wiggle the electrons. So the wavelength of light then becomes the wiggle period. It's half a micron. So if I bring this down from a centimeter to half a micron or a micron, I can bring the electron beam energy down by a similar factor and get the same hard X-rays we need for crystallography with wavelengths, make this about one angstrom. So you come from the GeV energies, which are very expensive to produce, uh, down to MeV energies. So that's where the cost reduction falls by making both the wiggle period short and therefore the electron beam energy much shorter. So that's the machine. Uh, it will produce more like a pure tone in frequency, whereas the LCLS, which operates on a different mechanism, SACI mode, is sort of amplified noise. It depends on stochastic fluctuations, which it picks up and amplifies. It'll sit somewhere between the performance of the SACI mode XFELs, like the LCLS, and the synchrotrons. It doesn't have as many photons per 
uh, per pulse, perhaps 10 to the 8th instead of 10 to the 11th. But it's highly, it has very high time coherence. And it's worth pointing out, it's very good for hard X, very hard X-rays, going up to kilovolts, many kilovolts, X, uh, 30 or 40 kilovolts, no problem. And very short pulses down to the uh, partial fraction of a femtosecond. And it's just worth commenting that, you know, to do time-resolved crystallography, as Keith Moffat taught us many years ago, you'd like to use the Lowy mode to span the rocking curve of the reflections in each shot, so you don't have to merge them. Well, if you make your pulses short enough, you get that for free, because to make a very short pulse in time by Fourier analysis, you need, um, I'm sorry, you need a very, a, a larger range of energies. In fact, the time and uncertainty principle bandwidth limit goes like this. The time in femtoseconds is four over the energy in EV. So if we go down to 14 attoseconds, necessarily our energy spread must be 300 EV, which is a, not a bad figure for doing Lowy. Here's the machine as it was in March. It's built into these rooms under a new building in the Biodesign Institute. And this is about the scale of it. You see that we can get up to 25 MeV electrons with just this very short linear accelerator here. And this is the laser table. There's one other idea. We plan to pattern the beam spatially and use emittance exchange to turn that pattern around into the time domain. And then by lithography in the semiconductor lithography, imposing this spatial pattern on the electron beam, we get the corresponding pattern on the time structure. Uh, and that will give us, again, help us do time resolve work because we can do things like chirping right any time structure we like by lithography. A related project which comes up frequently, uh, I've just written a paper about this in the festive for Ahmed Zewail, who unfortunately died quite recently, a great pioneer in this area, is the question of whether you could do this all with the electrons anyway. Why, have, why convert the electrons into x-rays? Why not just do electron diffraction? Uh, I've recently heard that you can get uh, 10 femtosecond pulses with 5 MeV electrons. Uh, Musumichi in UCLA has done that, published in PRL recently. The electron cross-section is thousands of times greater than the X-rays, uh, 10,000 times greater. But on the other hand, the x fel has gain, and those two factors sort of cancel out. There are no electron lasers, but you can get a gain of 10 to the fifth with the X-ray laser. So there are other issues uh, and to be compared in detail. And I can just summarize by saying the situation, because of a thing called emittance, is completely hopeless for single particle imaging. And it might work for proteins if we could grow wide, thin proteins. If you squeeze the electron beam down sideways, the electrons don't like that. The Coulomb repulsion drives them apart. And that gives you unwanted beam divergence. Now, if the beam divergence gets bigger than the Bragg angle, you can't do crystallography. So the product of the beam divergence and the beam size is constant. If I could work with a, I don't know, 100 micron beam, I could get very sharp Bragg spots and there'd be no problem. So if we make special proteins which are very wide and very thin, a few microns thin, that, that are transparent to 3 MeV electrons, you could outrun damage uh, with electron, do electron crystallography along the lines of the micro ED work which we're hearing a lot about. So you'd have micro ED without radiation damage. But if you want to squeeze your beam down to uh, a micron-sized crystal, you can't combine that with microcrystallography because then the, the, the Bragg spots enlarge and blur out. So I'll end with a completely new idea that Henry will probably say more about, uh, which has just been published in PRL by a young student, Anton Klassen, who I was, uh, saw a lot of in my visit to Hamburg recently, working in Henry's lab and with his professor at Erlangen. And they've proposed that instead of detecting the coherence scattering from our viruses, we should detect the X-ray fluorescence because there's so much more of it. Okay? Well, how do you get an image of a virus by detecting the X-ray fluorescence? Uh, one can imagine a, a spherical detector collecting all the inner shell, say the K x-rays from a virus sitting here, and you excite that by bringing in an x-ray laser pulse. Well, the theoretical part of their paper shows that if the x-ray pulse is brief enough, short compared to the lifetime of the x-ray emission, 
then all the X-ray emission from the different internal source atoms emitting K-shell X-rays are coherent and they'll interfere with one another. So you get a speckle pattern. Unfortunately, the speckle pattern is different for every shot because of some random stochastic phases that occur in the process, but their theoretical treatment, which follows along the lines of the Hanbury, Brown and Twist experiment, intensity interferometry, uh, shows how to wa that you can get them to wash out and gives the full theory for the case where the pulse duration becomes comparable with or longer the life than the lifetime of the excitation. Now these K-shell lifetimes are a few femtoseconds, so uh, people are building at a second X-ray lasers at the moment. So with a one femtosecond pulse, you would indeed get uh, a strong interference. Physically, this is rather like asking whether waves of different frequency can interfere. The answer is they can, briefly. And they can interfere for a time if your detection time is short compared to the beat period. You can think about tuning a piano. If you detect the sound within one beat, you would get a coherent interference between the two waves. Uh, and of course, their theory is more, much more general than that. But So uh, Henry has beam time to try out this idea early next year, I think. Uh, and it'll be interesting to see what can be made of that. If it works, it will be terrific. You've got more signal. Uh, in this arrangement, you get three-dimensional reconstruction in one shot because you collect all around a sphere, ideally. Uh, there's no direct beam to trouble us with this dynamic range problem. That's such a problem in single particle imaging. You saturate the detector with the straight through beam. There is no straight through beam here, but this Q nevertheless joins points on an Ewald sphere. Um, there's more scattering, and we can imagine doing chemical mapping. Uh, uh, if we tune into different points, you'd have to have filters and so forth. So it's a very exciting and interesting idea but a tremendous amount of work will be needed because of all the experimental problems. And here's just a simulation that, oh, you can't see it, I'm sorry, I did with my student. It's an MS2 capsid with the, it, we're looking along the five-fold axis, and if I'd set up the contrast correctly, you would have seen that it shows five-fold symmetry. Now, everyone in X-ray diffraction, if you look along a five-fold axis in a quasi-crystal would expect ten-fold symmetry by Friedel's law. Well, that's because we don't have a said direct beam. This is uh, fluorescence from internal sources interfering with itself. So you get the five-fold symmetry. Okay, I'm just about done. Here are the international, the FELs that are being made around the world, just to show you, as others have, that uh, this is a booming industry. There is machines, uh, the European XFEL will start uh, uh, collecting data for customers in a few weeks. There's a machine at... The LBL is making a second machine, LCLS2, that'll start in a few years. There's a PAL machine in Korea, in South Korea. There's a machine, I should have mentioned at Sackler, the most beautiful work we heard yesterday, which really was fabulous, um, <coughs> from bacteria Rhodopsin and also outstanding results on photosynthesis at very high resolution uh, in Japan. And of course, the machine in Switzerland uh, which is starting. So we have three machines starting this, taking customers this year. And in addition to the two earlier ones in Japan and uh, at SLAC near Stanford. The consortium I mentioned that, of which I'm the scientific director is shown here. So here are all the people, my acknowledgements that I've been collaborating with. The green ones are the structural biologists. Ed Latman is our director. He manages the outreach program and the education program and the patents and uh, and so forth, um, with Ed Snell. Uh, uh, Marius, I've mentioned his work in Milwaukee. James Fraser at UCSF, Rob, Rob, Roger Kornberg, you heard some results uh, from his work today at, in the micro symposium at the LCLS. Uh, Petra Fromm has a large group at ASU, Brenda Hogan, viruses. Uh, George Phillips should be here somewhere. And then the red people are in methods development. Uh, that includes myself, uh, Uwe, and um, James Holton has been a valuable authority at the ALS. Lois Pollock at Cornell, here's George. And Nadia Zatzepin uh, is in charge of the data analysis. Uh, Mark Messerschmidt also in Hamburg. So that's it. I think it is the birth of a new field. Um, and it really reminds me of this comment of uh, Humphrey Davy. This is 1806. What happened to him was a guy in Italy invented a battery. And of course, Davy uh, in London 
immediately used it to discover a whole range of elements because he had the, the EMF to do it, electrolysis and so forth. So he famously said that the nothing promotes the advancement of science so much as a new instrument. And I think that's exactly what we're seeing with the, the X-ray lasers in structural biology. Thank you. It's better and better. <laughs> when will the little paying. machine be uh, available? Uh, we're building two identical machines. One lasers, one doesn't. The non-lasing one will start in about six months. To make it laze, we have to put this uh, beam patterning thing on the electron beam. That may be another year. Terrific. Uh, so anyone wants to build one for your campus, come and see me. <laughs> we'll gladly give you the drawings and, what, and help. What is it, six million dollars? Yeah. It? Yeah, okay, easy. Um, any questions? Thank you very much for a nice, excellent review. And the, I have a question about the, that compact uh, XFL source. So the, um, what is the requirement for the uh, quality of the electron beam? For example, so such an XFL case, we can easily uh, estimate with uh, some of the PS parameters. So do, do you have some similar parameter in your scheme? I think the emittance is about 40 nanometer radians. Uh-huh, uh-huh, uh-huh. Uh, remember, this is inverse Compton. It's not, yeah. uh, the requirement is probably different. In inverse Compton, there is no gain. It's actually super radiant uh -huh. mode uh -huh. rather than uh, gain. So you mean that you do not have some threshold, but uh, some the, you could much easier, you, 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 you are saying much easier to have some. The, much easier, uh, yes. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. Okay. Yes, correct. Thank you. Any other questions? Let's go, and have, let's go and have dinner. No, in that case, can we uh, thank the speaker, John Spence, please? Oh, excellent. Right. Excellent. And uh, Professor Banerjee will be coming up in a second. Oh. Okay. Oh, is this a... On behalf of the organizers, it's my honor to present a token of appreciation to the plenary speaker, Professor John Spence. Thank you very much. Wonderful to be here. Also, it has been really honored to uh, present a token of appreciation to the IUCI Vice President, Professor Mike Laser. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much.